from uh, formerly Princeton and uh, now uh, 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 DeepMind and uh, uh, UCL London. Good morning. I uh, just want to start by saying thank you to the organizers for uh, including me in this. I was going to say thank you for putting my talk first, but then I just found out it was alphabetical. <laughs> I suppose I should say, I suppose there was a moment where the alphabetizing idea was floated and they didn't, they didn't say, oh God, that would put Botvinnik first, let's do something else. So I, I suppose I'm still grateful. Um, but in any case, uh, it's good to see old friends and uh, look forward to um, meeting those of you I haven't, haven't met before. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I work um, at this company called DeepMind, um, whose uh, mission is to solve ar artificial general intelligence. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about some work that I undertook um, around the time I arrived there two years ago, uh, but I wanna put it in some context, um, and, and that'll, uh, that'll involve me telling you a little bit more about DeepMind. Um, so around the time that I uh, arrived, um, my new colleagues there were celebrating uh, the publication of a, a nature paper um, in, in which they described um, uh, superhuman level performance um, from, uh, from a deep learning system on, uh, on a classic suite of old Atari games. Um, many of you would be familiar with this work. Uh, and it didn't take long before this was followed up by the amazing work um, of David Silver and others on uh, the game of Go, um, and which of course has continued to, to advance in, in papers like this more recent one on um, uh, chess and other games. By the way, if you, if you don't know about um, these recent developments in AI research and you're curious, I, I recommend this movie. I just, I just watched it myself. It was, it's a documentary that was put together by a set of independent filmmakers. It was, it's, not like a, it's not like a promotional video for DeepMind. Um, it's quite excellent and quite, uh, you know, quite so it quite um, gets into the cultural issues in a very interesting way. So anyway, I, I joined the company partially because I was excited about the AI mission, but I also looked at the, you know, the technology that was being applied, and I thought, gee, you know, this is, this is something that should be of interest to people like me who um, want to figure out how the brain works and how the human mind works. Um, why, why is it relevant? Well, if you know about the technology, and then it's kind of obvious, it centers on deep neural networks, which while they're, um, they don't attempt to fit to fine-grained biological details, are nonetheless broadly inspired by the operation of um, biological neural networks, uh, and um, perhaps more importantly, uh, architectures that are very similar to the ones used in the Atari work have been applied quite recently to modeling um, neural response properties in the, in the ventral stream, uh, in the primate brain, for example, and the work by Yamans and DiCarlo, which many of you will know. Uh, so interesting connection there. Um, which has to do with how neural systems do representation learning. But there's also another side to this, which is about what drives the learning, and that, um, uh, as many of you will know, uh, involves uh, advances in using deep neural networks to do reinforcement learning, hence the name deep reinforcement learning. Um, there's, again, here a very close connection with um, developments, recent developments in, in neuroscience. Well, not so recent, actually. Um, maybe over the last 20 years, one could say, uh, um, a more and more solid connection has been forged between um, computational reinforcement learning uh, and, al and algorithms based in particular on temporal difference learning on the one hand and um, uh, dopaminergic uh, uh, learning uh, mechanisms in, in the brain. So I'm hoping that m many if not most of you are at least broadly familiar with the dopamine story in neuroscience. Um, um, but there's still more uh, in, in terms of uh, you know, what's here to be interested in a, as a neuroscientist. So the, the work that I just described used mainly feed-forward networks uh, that don't have recurrent connections, but there's also been a lot of um, progress in, at both at DeepMind and elsewhere in, uh, in training recurrent neural networks using deep reinforcement learning. Um, so just to give one example, this is uh, just a schematic way of showing a convolutional neural network that's outputting a, a value function and a policy. Um, and we can unroll this thing in time to show that it's a recurrent neural network, which therefore has memory. Um, and you can use networks like this, as people at DeepMind have done, to navigate uh, mazes, discover goals, and then when you respawn in a new location in this previously unfamiliar maze, you go right to the goal. Um, tasks that I think uh, my colleague uh, Greg Wayne will talk a lot about later. 
Um, this is directly germane to uh, neural models that address actual biological brains um, in the sense that recurrent networks have been applied in a growing number of papers to, uh, to uh, try to understand how um, cir recurrent circuits in the brain support things like working memory um, and indeed uh, um, uh, reinforcement learning mechanisms in that context. These are just you know, emblematic uh, figures from, uh, from uh, well-known papers. Um, so this, this connection between neuroscience relevant uh, ideas and um, AI tech, uh, at least at DeepMind, was no coincidence. The company was um, founded on an idea that, in fact, um, if we want to solve AGI, it might be smart to look at neuroscience. So this is not a coincidence. It's part of the strategy uh, that we continue to apply at DeepMind. And this is a paper that my colleagues and I wrote um, recently for Neuron, um, trying to kind of lay out our, our philosophy on that. So um, this is what I was excited about uh, when I arrived and what I continue to be excited about. But, um, but even as the uh, Atari work was um, becoming more and more well known, um, there were some voices of, I'm not sure if the word, right word is dissent, but maybe concern uh, in the cognitive science and neuroscience community. Um, perhaps the most uh, salient uh, uh, um, example um, is Brendan Lake, who along with uh, a few um, uh, well-known colleagues wrote a paper for uh, brain and behavioral sciences um, specifically focusing on the Atari work that came out of DeepMind and suggesting that as amazing as the results were, uh, they failed to um, satisfyingly capture um, some fundamental aspects of human intelligence, even human intelligence as expressed in the context of video games. So what they, what they pointed out was if you look at um, DQN, which is the deep learning architecture, the, the DeepRL architecture that um, had been built uh, at DeepMind for Atari games, uh, it, it becomes clear when you look at learning curves, the performance of this network over the course of learning, that it requires a huge amount of data. It really has to, it has to essentially play these video games for a very long time before it reaches those amazing superhuman levels of, um, of aptitude. And in order to make, uh, uh, make this point uh, more strongly, um, Brendan, in this paper, contrasted that with his own performance on uh, an Atari game that he'd never played before, uh, a game called Frostbite. Um, and you can see the contrast is very striking. Uh, only after um, a few minutes of play, Brendan was able to get a respectable score on, on this game, uh, whereas DQN took millions and millions of frames and thousands of uh, wall clock uh, um, uh, uh, hours in order to uh, get to a comparable level. So things have changed since the paper was originally drafted. Um, the kinds of techniques that are involved in DQN have become more sample, efi sample efficient, but it's still the case that there's a salient mismatch here. Humans are just a lot more efficient at learning uh, than these deep reinforcement learning systems. So um, why is this? Well, it's kind of obvious, I think, on reflection why this is. Brendan came to Frostbite, this novel video game for him, uh, with a lot of background knowledge. First of all, he knew how to see, uh, whereas DQN did not. Um, but let's put that part aside. Um, he also had a lot of sort of do domain relevant uh, past experience. So, you know, he, he dealt with computers before, he had played games before, he played video games before. Um, he presumably knew what an igloo uh, is, which is something that's relevant to kind of figuring out what's going on in Frostbite. So, um, not only did he have all this background knowledge, but he could skillfully bring all this background knowledge to bear in trying to figure out what's going on in an efficient way in this nominally new situation, this new game. Um, so what, I, what I'm gesturing toward with that last comment is that not only did he have background knowledge, but he'd also, he also has the ability to uh, learn efficiently because he's learned how to learn. He's, um, He's able to, he, his past experiences allow him not only to apply knowledge, but to apply knowledge in an efficient way. He's, he knows how to learn a new video game. So this term learning to learn is not new. Uh, it was coined back in the 1940s by a, psycho a psychologist named Harry Harlow. Um, and he, um, he operationalized it in a very clever uh, experiment with monkeys, and he later replicated this with young children. And I'm going to use it as a kind of running example, so let me explain what he did. Um, so he had a, a monkey in a, in a cage uh, with bars where the monkey could reach 
reach through and grab um, objects that were placed in front of the cage. And on each trial in task, uh, Harlow put two objects in front of the monkey and allowed the monkey to pick up one. Um, and when the monkey picked up that object, it saw a, a well that was underneath the object, and it discovered whether or not there was a, a morsel of food in that well. Um, and then uh, after, the, if there was food there, the monkey was allowed to partake. Um, and on the next trial, the objects were put back in place, either in the same positions or left, right, reversed, uh, and the whole procedure repeated. And it repeated for six rounds. So the monkey dealt with the same two objects six times in a row. But then critically, Harlow replaced those two objects with two completely new objects that presumably the monkey had never seen. And the whole process started over, and this was followed by yet another pair, and yet another pair, and yet another pair, for hundreds of, of pairs. Always six steps in each, in each round. <coughs> um, and across these pairs of objects, there was a simple rule, which was that for any pair of objects, there was one object that was good, arbitrarily chosen, uh, and the other object was bad. Good meant you get the food, bad meant you don't. Uh, and it doesn't matter where the objects are spatially. It's just the, the identity of the object. And what Harlow reported uh, is diagrammed here. So this is, these are the six trials uh, in each block with each, with each pair of objects. And the, on the y-axis is the percent of, of trials at that step where the monkey chose the right object, the one that, that yielded the food. Um, and you can see that over the course of a block, the monkey gets better and better. But that's a rather gradual process early on. Um, the interesting thing is what happens after the monkey has done uh, 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 on the order of 100 rounds of the task. And what you see then is shown in pink here. The monkey chooses one object uh, arbitrarily. It can't do better than that. It doesn't know which the good object is. But on the second trial, uh, and from there on, the monkey is at ceiling. The monkey is essentially perfect. And that, it doesn't matter whether the monkey was rewarded on the first trial or not. It infers what the right object is, even though these are two objects that it's never seen before. So Harlow coined the term learning to learn in this context. The monkey had, you know, so to speak, figured out what's going on in this task. It, had underst it understood the invariance. It understood the task structure and was able to apply that um, in learning about two new objects. Samantha? Yes? It's called learning to learn. I mean, I guess it may be semantic, but it looks like you're learning, learning statistical structure of the world. Yeah, so you, so. Learning to learn seems to have sort of deeper connotations. So um, let's talk about that later. One, another, I think another version of that question is, what's the difference between learning and inference, right? Um, I think one reason I like this example is that you have two completely new objects. So there's something genuinely new going on. Um, you could still characterize it as inference. Maybe you could characterize all learning as inference. Um, but there's something learning like here, right? I, I'll actually, so that allows me to say um, that when I get to neuroscience, which I will, um, I'm going to talk about some tasks that don't involve this, um, this really strong form of novelty. And there, it's, it, there it does feel like a little bit of a push to call, the, call it learning to learn. But I hope you'll see that computationally, the issues are all pretty much underlyingly the same. Um, and I'll come back and make some comments about how, how we could push this, the ideas I'm going to present further until they really feel like they're engaging something we'd want to call learning, uh, if I can get to that at the end. Okay, so, so the question I want to address in discussing our own research is, uh, how in the world can we get systems like this, um, which are doing amazing things but aren't sample efficient, to do things like uh, Harlow's monkeys were able to do, where they leverage past experience, they extract uh, abstractions that capture the structure of a task domain, and then apply those efficiently um, when uh, nominally new uh, situations are presented. How can we get learning to learn? What do we have to add to architectures like this? And um, the answer that I'm, gonna, um, that I'm gonna argue for is nothing. We don't have to add anything. Uh, in fact, these architectures are perfectly fine at doing learning to learn. You just have to put them in the right situations. Um, so let me explain what I mean uh, still in a kind of AI setting, and then um, I'll move to neuroscience, because my, my argument is going to be that the computational principles I'll now lay out um, are, are potentially relevant to understanding the brain. So um, I said you don't have to add anything, but um, there, are, there are two things, two ingredients you have to have. These are ingredients we already sometimes use, um, uh, and they don't involve any technological innovation, but they are nonetheless critical. One is, you have to use systems with memory. Um, in the work that I'm going to describe, that involves basically using um, rather ordinary uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, but essentially, any architecture uh, that involves memory um, will do. And I'll come back to this. 
Uh, and the second key ingredient um, is that it's not enough to train uh, a deep re reinforcement learning system on one task uh, and expect it to show the kind of interesting transfer uh, effects that I was just describing. Instead, you have to train a system on a bunch of tasks. Uh, and I, and um, critically, you have to train the system on a bunch of tasks that uh, differ on the surface, but that, that share some underlying statistical uh, commonality. Um, and I'll give concrete examples of this as we go along. So um, before I dive in on the specifics, I just want to acknowledge um, that the ideas that I'm going to be talking about uh, were, were introduced um, in large part uh, in a classic paper by Hochreiter and colleagues. They addressed um, supervised learning, and uh, I'm going to be describing applications to reinforcement learning, which I think arguably involves genuinely new issues. Um, and, uh, and Hochreiter didn't talk about the brain, but there is a definite intellectual debt here, and I want to just um, make sure to acknowledge that. Okay, so how can recurrent neural, neural networks in uh, multitask environments uh, spontaneously give rise to the kind of learning to learn phenomena that we've, we've, um, we've uh, isolated? So I'm going to use this diagram as we go along. Um, this uh, is uh, meant, to, meant to represent a, a, a multi-layer perceptron, just a bunch of input units, a, a hidden layer, and a bunch of output units. Um, and these are the, the internal or hidden units. Um, the inputs and the outputs are important. So the one input will be some kind of observation of the environment, um, which in some simulations will be pixel level inputs, like those that were involved in the examples I gave earlier. Sometimes it'll just be a simple one hot in tasks that really don't require that kind of visual um, observation. Um, importantly, however, there are others. So the system will need to know what it did on the last time step. What was the last action it performed? So you can think about this as a form of corollary discharge. Um, uh, and uh, also importantly, the system needs to know what reward it got on the last time step. So these may seem like um, uh, rather uh, um, particular demands for the way we set up our architecture, but um, in fact, when I say the system needs to know what reward it got on the last time step, that could just mean that um, you know, the system recognizes the taste of juice, uh, it, you know, if, it's a, if we're modeling a monkey in an experiment where juice is the reward. Um, on the output side, we'll have an action. This is going to be a reinforcement learning model. Um, and also, um, as a highly conventional measure, we're going to have the system um, uh, emitting an estimate of uh, the state value. So this is going to be, for those of you familiar with actor critic um, or A3C uh, a version of that from DeepMind, um, that's what we're doing here. Critically, these internal or hidden units are going to connect with one another. Uh, and making the thing a recurrent neural network, and that's where uh, the system is endowed with memory. Um, and then we're going to train the system using backpropagation through time. Um, but importantly, we're going to do that in a reinforcement learning setting. So we're going to use um, A3C, a version of reinforce, uh, with an actor critic-like baseline. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with th those labels for algorithms, just think um, reinforcement learning, and we can, uh, we can talk about the details offline um, if you're interested. So um, let me give you an initial uh, illustration of what that simple recurrent neural network uh, architecture does when you put it in, an, in a multitask environment. And we're going to use a very simple form of multitask environment, just starting with uh, bandit problems. So uh, we'll start with a two-arm bandit that has, uh, it's a beta Bernoulli bandit. The, the, arm pr the payoff parameters for the two arms are, are drawn from a simple distribution. And the, uh, the agent, the recurrent network, deals with this task for uh, a set number of trials, say you know, 50 trials. Uh, on a, each step, it chooses whether it wants left or right, sees what happens, and moves on to the next trial. So it has to solve the explore-exploit um, problem that's inherent in, uh, in bandit problems in RL in general. But then critically, after we've given it those fixed number of trials on that bandit problem, we'll reinitialize re the activities in the network, and we'll give it another bandit problem. Um, with the parameters, again, randomly sampled. And after that, we'll give it another bandit problem, and so forth and so on. Um, so what happens uh, after you've trained a network on a sufficient number of bandit problems of this kind, and then you give it a new bandit problem? Um, well, uh, I'm about to show you, but there's one important um, point I want to make so to guide interpretation of the results I'm going to show. And that is that at test, we're going to turn off Reinforcement, lear re reinforcement learning. We're going to set the learning rate on the reinforcement learning algorithm that's adjusting the weights in the network to zero. Uh, 
So any learning that's evident in the network's behavior can't be attributed to weight changes or you know, synaptic changes, if you want to um, think of the analogy that way. It's all reflective of the activity dynamics of the recurrent neural network. Okay, so that's a critical point. So what we see um, is illustrated here. So uh, in this red box is an indication of what happens on an individual trial in an easy bandit problem. Dark blue means left, um, light blue means right. Uh, the network tries, a, tries uh, left, then it tries right, then it tries left, and um, after that it settles on, uh, on, on right, which in this case is the right answer, and you can see across trials, which are rows here, it gets the right answer almost every time. When the task is harder, that is to say you're giving it a bandit with parameters that are closer together, uh, it explores for longer, but then eventually settles into the right, quest, the, the right answer. Um, here. This is the same network, just given two different bandit problems. And if you look at the, um, the performance of the network uh, on uh, a, fixed, um, uh, a fixed bandit problem um, and look at its cumulative regret, uh, it turns out that the network's doing a very good job of um, managing the explore-exploit um, dilemma. Its, its um, regret curve is you know, comparable to what you see. It doesn't, mu doesn't quite match Gittins, but it's actually better than what you get from uh, off-the-shelf algorithms like Thompson sampling or UCB. Uh, short question. Yes. Um, so I'm surprised that you say it, it performs well because it doesn't seem to me to be a good strategy to first pick left, I don't know, pick right one time and left 13 times, 12 times, or something? I mean, to me, it would sound better to just alternate in the beginning to get an estimate, and, and depending, of course, on, on the payoff. Yes, that's right. It depends on the payoffs, and that's the critical thing. So you can actually, if, if you get unlucky, um, and the payoffs that you get uh, which are, of course, stochastic, uh, seem to suggest that the right arm is left when, in fact, it's right, uh, you may spend some time uh, dwelling on the left when uh, an, an omniscient viewer knows you shouldn't have done that. Um, but that's the point of these, um, these curves. Gittins is the, is, um, the proven optimal for beta Bernoulli get bandits. Um, and we, we don't quite match it, but we come close. Um, but I'll talk more about strategy in a second. Uh, so again, what I'm showing you here is the performance of a network with no weight changes going on. It's all the dynamics of, it's all the activity dynamics. So what's happened here is that um, the reinforcement learning algorithm that's adjusting the weights is um, the main effect of, of that learning is to adjust the, dyna the activity dynamics of the recurrent network so that eventually those, those uh, recurrent uh, dynamics uh, themselves implement a learning algorithm. So, and that can be executed without any weight changes. Um, so uh, you can look, you can, you can get a sense of how this learning algorithm, this kind of uh, meta -learn this, uh, this uh, acquired learning algorithm operates by um, doing um, dimensionality reduction visualizations on the hidden state of the network over the course of these um, bandit problems. And this will come back to what I was just saying about trajectories. So in a, in a problem in that where that's very easy and the correct answer is on the left, what you find is that the, the hidden state of the network uh, follows a trajectory um, toward one attractor in a very smooth way. If the correct answer is on the other side uh, and the problem is easy, you again see um, what look very much like attractor dynamics. If the problem is harder, then sometimes you'll see reversals where the network will kind of head in one direction and then double back um, uh, and correct itself later. So what we're seeing here in, in action is an acquired learning algorithm that's different from the one that was, uh, was um, programmed by hand uh, and that is expressed at the level of the activity dynamics rather than, than the connection weights. Yeah. Yes? It's not constant in the network. I mean, how many trials back does it want us to remember? Um, so uh, this is an, it's an LSTM, I should have mentioned that. So it can, it can remember just about as far back uh, as your backpropagation window goes. Uh, and we were liberal with that in, this, um, uh, in these simulations. So we gave it a large enough backprop window that, it could, uh, that the, the gradients could go back to critical events um, in, 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 the early, in the earlier time series. But that's something that um, one might want to think about um, in less um, kind of Machiavellian ways if one were trying to model biological data. Yes? So this is a really clear illustration of the bifurcation and kind of strategy according to how the statistics work out. Mm -hmm. But it seems the example is a little bit toy compared to the real world mm -hmm. because it's an all or nothing, absolutely good, absolutely bad. Whereas I don't know that outside trees and grass ever gives you such, am such unambiguous answers. Does this also do interesting and useful things in the continuous realm? 
when it's not a discrete choice or not? Um, you mean c continuous action spaces? Um, continuous action and continuous perception. I mean, real brains move in a continuous world, so I'm wondering, have you looked at that? Um, I've got lots of other examples, um, and w once I've gone through them, um, maybe uh, raise your hand again and tell me w which ones were satisfying or, which, or whether you're still lo um, looking for something. Yeah, this is clearly just an initial illustration, but um, I think it is important to defend bandit problems as, as interesting. Certainly, they've occupied um, control theory for, for years. Um, here's something about bandit problems that's, uh, to me, even more interesting, interesting and exciting. Um, by the way, I just want to check. I have until quarter of? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. So um, I, 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 I've already said that um, the way I think about what's going on here is that you have the, the hand-coded um, reinforcement learning algorithm, and then you have uh, what's, I think, legitimately um, uh, called a, a learned learning algorithm or an acquired learning algorithm, which is expressed in the, the dynamics. And one cool thing is that that acquired learning algorithm needn't have any of the properties of the original learning algorithm, and in general, it will be quite different. And in particular, it will be fit to the statistics of the domain in which the system was trained. So it, the first example I gave um, involved Beta Bernoulli um, bandits, which means that the parameters on the two arms were, uh, were um, independent. Uh, they were sampled IID. They were sampled independent of one another uh, across episodes. But now let's imagine that um, instead of doing that, we um, fix things so that the parameters on the arms vary across episodes, but they're, um, they're perfectly uh, anti-correlated. So I, I choose a, a, a Bernoulli parameter for one arm, and then I just set the other one to one minus whatever that parameter is. This is a much easier problem to solve uh, because what you learn about uh, one arm implies something about the other arm, which is not true in the Beta Bernoulli case. Um, and what we find is that the network capitalizes on that. So it shows much lower regret, suggesting that uh, it has tuned in to these statistics um, and, uh, and, and is getting away with, uh, with, with, um, uh, with, uh, with lower regret. It's, it's picking the right action more efficiently because it has, its, its learning algorithm, its exploration strategy uh, exploits the structure that's there. Yeah. Could you explain to me? Why is that uh, there is a, the slope is different between the, the, the best possible behavior and the, uh, the one that you get? So the, um, the, actually the black lines there are no longer um, really relevant because they only apply to the Beta Bernoulli case. The, the, the important distinction is between the red curve and the blue curve, which are both generated by my recurrent network. And the fact that um, the fact that the blue curve is, is leveling out sooner means that it's finding the right answer sooner. It's, it, is that what you were asking? Ever, ever leveling out, or is the red curve, or? Oh, is the red curve ever leveling out? Right. Or is it forever going to have a rate of regret? Um, there, are, there are cases, especially when the bandit problem is hard, that the network um, uh, uh, decides on the wrong answer and sticks with it. Which is, which is also true of, of many um, uh, high-performing uh, hand-coded uh, algorithms. So, because if, the, if, you, do, if you get very unlucky um, and you get, sp you get data that suggests that the left arm is right, when in fact the right arm is right, you might, um, you might end up sampling the, the, the best arm very rarely. And that, that's, it's just because this is an average over trials. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, cool. All right. Um, Okay, good. So hopefully um, you've all got the, the idea now. Let's, uh, let's just apply this to a bunch of stuff, and um, well, let's start with Harlow's task. So uh, in order to do this um, in DeepMind style, we, uh, we came up with uh, visual inputs that, um, uh, that were pixel-based, and they looked exactly like this. This is exactly what the network got, just at a lower, vi a lower uh, resolution. Um, it's a simulated video screen with two objects uh, between which the agent had to choose by saccading left or right, uh, and the objects here are just patches of, uh, of ImageNet images. Um, six trials with the same two images. One of them was good, one of them was bad, uh, and then two new images were chosen uh, and so forth. So it's exactly like Harlow's task. And what we find um, is that this uh, rather ordinary recurrent neural network, here augmented just with a front end uh, to do some uh, visual processing or a uh, convolutional neural network, um, behaves exactly like Harlow's uh, 
uh, animals. So after a significant amount of um, experience, when it's presented with two completely new image patches that it's never dealt with before, it chooses one at random, and then after that, it knows what the, what the good image is. Um, okay, so uh, now let's, let's pivot to, um, to neuroscience. Uh, because as we were doing this work, um, the idea impressed itself more and more upon me that um, there were things here that reminded me uh, of, uh, of things that I had been taught about the brain, uh, and we decided to explore that. And um, so the, the, I'm gonna tell you now about that work, which I'm pleased to say um, has just been accepted uh, <coughs> at Nature Neuroscience, so we'll have a report out about that soon. And we actually just put it on archive if anybody wants to check out the details ahead of that. Yeah, yeah. This, this Harlow's task. Sorry? If you had been doing Harlow's task, the cut presentations could be like 10 minutes or 15 minutes apart, and they'd just learn it just fine. Yes. Whereas your recurrent network needs to keep running. That no, that's not true. That's not true. You freeze it between trials, or? or no, so you, you um, there, uh, you, our procedure is we re reinitialize the um, activities of the hidden units. The, the weights in the network are frozen, right? The, the weights in the network, oh, I, okay, sorry, okay, I think I see what you're saying. In other words, oh, between presentations of the same two objects. Yeah, yes, true. okay, yes, thank you. That is true. And um, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna explain the neuroscience perspective on this, but um, uh, let me just bookmark that by saying that the system that I'm going to describe, if you interpret it in a neuroscientific context, w operates a little bit um, like a, a hippocampal amnesic. So as long as, things, as long as it's keeping things active in working memory, it can apply past experience to present action. Uh, but the minute you d distract it for a second, it can't bring that, it can't bring that back. Um, and that's, uh, that's something that we've, we've rectified um, in, in recent work. So I can, I can, I'll touch on that right at the end, um, but we've basically augmented the system with an episodic memory and it, it can handle that sort of thing now. Um, in, in, I, in what I think is a psychologically and biologically interesting way. Um, but I can talk to you more about that. Okay, so pivoting to neuroscience. We already have a link because uh, there are many people who are convinced that uh, the temporal difference um, uh, reward prediction error from uh, reinforcement learning uh, has something to do with phasic dopaminergic signaling in the brain. So we'll just take that on board and, um, uh, and uh, think of this red arrow, which is tuning the weights in this system, uh, as um, uh, in terms of uh, biological learning driven by dopamine. Um, but the other thing that we're gonna do, that's my icon for dopamine, the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna think about the recurrent network itself and its uh, activity dynamics as relating to uh, what we know about the prefrontal cortex. So I'm gonna speak here globally about the prefrontal cortex, which of course is absurd because we know there are many um, uh, important uh, regional differences within that structure. I'm also going to say, uh, I'm gonna include the circuits, the recurrent circuits that run from the prefrontal cortex through its uh, subcortical associates in the thalamus and basal ganglia. Um, again, an absurd level of abstraction. However, um, I'm, I'm not the first, not even the first in this room, uh, to um, undertake uh, to think about the way that the prefrontal cortex works by studying the behavior of rather simple recurrent neural networks. And this is a strategy that we've seen pay off in past research and hopefully it'll do so here. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna think about dopamine as analogous to the, um, to the reinforcement learning algorithm that's tuning the system weights. And we're gonna think about the recurrent dynamics um, as something that uh, uh, the prefrontal cortex is implementing in the brain. Okay, so armed with that set of analogies, can we take this system and uh, apply it to experimental findings for neuroscience uh, and gain any insight? Um, and so in the paper that I mentioned, we, we have a series of nine simulations which address a very diverse set of phenomena, and I'm just gonna speed through um, a subset of those to give you a flavor of, of what, what we're up to, um, and hopefully, given the, the preceding uh, discussion, you'll be in a position to get the gist, and then I'm happy to go into any details people wanna hear. So let's start with um, something very much like a bandit task uh, that's been studied in the monkey neurophysiology literature and focus on uh, this great paper by uh, Susui and colleagues um, from a couple years ago. Uh, the idea here is that a monkey is given two visual targets. It has to saccade to one or the other. Uh, and across trials, this being a bandit task, uh, those two visual targets are associated with particular payoff schedules. 
Um, and critically, as in our, uh, our toy bandit example, these payoff parameters are changing across testing sessions. So the monkey has to figure out what's going on in any testing session uh, and, um, and uh, concentrate its behavior on the option that has the greater payoff. Um, this is behavioral data from, from the experimental study, and um, uh, an interesting side note is that given the payoff uh, probabilities in this task, the structure of the reward schedule, actually it was not the optimal strategy to choose one uh, option and just stick with it. Uh, that is, maximizing in that sense was not the right strategy, but rather uh, it's a better idea to do something called probability matching where you match your uh, sampling rate for each target uh, to the uh, to um, a, a measure that's related to the number of payoffs you've gotten on that side. So as the the um, the uh, the ratio of rewards received changes across across uh, training sessions, uh, so does the um, the uh, the percentage of choices from one option to the other. We train this recurrent neural network, same architecture I described before, on exactly this task, and we get exactly the same behavior. The red dots here are just held out, um, held, held out uh, parameters, uh, so the system interpolates in a, in a satisfying way. One interesting thing, though, is that this is the same network that was maximizing on the Beta Bernoulli bandits. So not only is it doing something that looks like what the monkeys are doing, but it's also uh, spontaneously figured out that the right strategy here is different from the one in the, in the bandit task we described before. Okay, that's just a behavioral effect, though. Um, yes? Where does the noise come from? Uh, where does the noise come from? Yeah. Um, These lines are kind of fuzzy, right? Ah, uh, well, the, the payoffs are stochastic. So to some extent, that's, well, I think that, well, not just to some extent. I think that is literally the only source of noise in this task. Right, so, the, so for, each for each action, there's a stochastic payoff, so the monkey can be fooled just as, uh, as it can be fooled in a, in a Beta Bernoulli banded task. Okay, All right, uh, yeah? By, by, the, um, by the same network, you don't mean the same weights. You, you no, no, this is trained from scratch, trained from scratch, that's right. Um, but it's an example of where the learned learning algorithm is fit to the statistics of the domain. All right, so, uh, Recall that in these simulations, at test time, we're holding the weights of the system fixed. So we don't think that's what's going on in a monkey, uh, but it helps us interpret the behavior of the model because we know, by construction, that um, any learning that we see in the, in the artificial system has to reflect its activity dynamics, not its weight changes. And for that, um, for that reason, we're able to go inside that hidden layer and look at how the um, latent representation is evolving and um, find out something about um, how the network is doing what it's doing. Um, and this is a nice thing to be able to do in the context of the Susui uh, um, study because that study was actually an electrophysiology um, experiment where they looked uh, um, uh, specifically at what prefrontal neurons were doing during the course of, of performing this task. And what they found was that uh, there were neurons that coded uh, for a variety of uh, quantities uh, during the during, uh, performance of this task. One was simply what, what choice the animal was about to make. But more interestingly, there were neurons that coded for the, um, the value of that choice in an anticipatory way. Um, and then, perhaps most interesting, there were neurons that uh, seemed to be keeping track of the history of actions and reward outcomes. Um, and this is just a histogram that shows the proportion of neurons uh, in their data that coded for these different things. Um, so what's going on in our network? Well, to some extent, um, well, so when we look at what's being, what's being represented by the, the units in our hidden layer, it's exactly the same variables. In, in a way, this is a, like an obvious, it had to be this way, otherwise it would be deeply mysterious how the network is doing what it's doing. It's doing reinforcement learning, which means it has to keep track of recent action outcome uh, history, uh, and the only way it can do that is in its activity patterns, since we're holding the weights constant. Um, we can again go under the hood uh, and look at, um, at, at how these representations evolve, um, as we did before. Um, but I'm not gonna take the time to go into the results, but you can get the gist. So this is an initial example of how we can apply this meta-reinforcement learning idea to neural data, and what we end up with um, from this and other simulations I'm about to tell you about uh, is um, an I the idea that actually the recurrent dynamics that um, come out of uh, the um, loops of the connect the loops um, within uh, uh, prefrontal cortex and perhaps running through its associated subcortical regions. It's the activity dynamics that are driving learning in tasks like um, the one that Susui studied. However, those 
the, those dynamics are shaped by dopamine over longer time scales. That's the, that's the, the neuroscience version of this meta-reinforcement learning story that I introduced um, in more abstract terms before. Um, now, uh, I made a big deal of this, the fact that this learned learning algorithm uh, will exploit or will be fit to the statistics of the training uh, domain. Um, and now I want to uh, present another simulation of a neuroscience study that I, I think gets at that idea. So there's a very nice study from 2007 by Tim Behrens and colleagues where they looked at um, uh, human performance on a task where there were, uh, it's a bandit task, and there were periods during which the parameters of the task remained constant, and he referred to these as stable periods, and then there were periods where the parameters flipped back and forth um, rapidly, he referred to these as volatile periods, and um, he used uh, model fitting to infer the effective learning rate um, involved in the human subject's uh, um, behavioral adjustments, and found that during stable periods, the um, learning rate would uh, would fall to low, relatively low levels, and then during the um, volatile periods, uh, the learning rate would bump up to a higher level, and he showed with a, an ideal observer model that this was um, a smart thing to do. Uh, and what we find with our meta-RL system is exactly the same thing. So you train the network on bandit problems that go through stable periods and that go through volatile periods, and then you, you look at its behavior and you use, it's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, um, uh, recursive, but you use a, a reinforcement learning model to infer its effective learning rate. Um, and what you find is that the learning algorithm that is, imbe that is embedded in its activity dynamics um, moves to a, a, a low learning rate during stable periods and a high learning rate during volatile periods, um, which is something that, of course, was not at all involved in the RL algorithm that was used to train the weights in the system. So here again, we have an example of the acquired RL algorithm that's expressed in the dynamics absorbing um, properties of the training domain, fitting itself to, um, to properties of the particular domain in which, in which it was trained. I'm going to skip that. Okay, so one more, let me tell you about one more simulation. Um, so uh, the examples that I've given so far focused on uh, prefrontal activation. I skipped over a slide showing that, as in Tim Barron's study where they found neurons coding for volatility in prefrontal cortex, we also find that in our network. Those are studies about that address prefrontal uh, phenomena, but we can also address um, findings relating to dopamine with this system, and I'll just give you one example of this. So here's, a, here's a, 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 a simple and elegant result that has been considered to be rather um, challenging or puzzling from the point of view of standard models of how dopamine works um, to drive learning. This is from a study by Bromberg, Martin, and colleagues. So here a monkey was given either a left target or a right target. Uh, and um, this wasn't a choice task. The monkey was just expected to saccade to the given target. Um, but the key, the key manipulation was that in some blocks, uh, the, the left target would be followed by a, a juice reward, and in other blocks, the right target would be followed by that reward, and, the, and, and um, it was only ever one target that was rewarded. And critically, the monkey had to, the monkey wasn't, th these changes weren't signaled. So the monkey would be going along, it would be rewarded for left, and then all of a sudden, without warning, things would switch, uh, and now it would be the right, uh, the right target that's rewarded. So the monkey, um, if it wanted to be able to predict what was gonna happen, just had to kind of keep track of recent events and, and critically had to understand the structure of the task. So in other it, sometimes it would reverse. So um, the critical finding in the study had to do with dopamine. Um, and uh, uh, so let's, let's consider a scenario in which left has been rewarded for a while. Uh, and now the monkey sees uh, a left target. Well, what's gonna happen when you measure dopaminergic uh, activity? Uh, the classic story tells you that you should see a burst at that point, and in fact, that's what they observed. Um, uh, but the critical question is what happens uh, when a reversal occurs? So the monkey's going along, it's rewarded for left, and then uh, it sees a left, and then it's not rewarded for that. What happens on the very next trial, right after a reversal? Well. If the monkey sees that same target again, so it saw left, it thought it was gonna be rewarded, and then it wasn't, now on the next trial it sees left again, dopamine does not spike, in fact there's a little bit of a dip, um, which, uh, which indicates that the system has like, gets it that there was a reversal, but so far there's nothing deeply mysterious going on because the monkey already had an experience uh, of non-reward with this target. The really cool thing is what happens if you're rewarded for left, rewarded for left, and then all of a sudden not rewarded for left, and on the next trial, you get a right. And what um, Bromberg, Martin, and colleagues showed was that uh, you see, a, you see a, a reversal for dopaminergic activity even for that case. So 
there's a reversal that's, uh, that's signaled by an outcome for one target, and then on the next trial, the other target occurs, and dopamine is making the right prediction, which suggests a form of structure learning or latent state inference, um, uh, which isn't part, it's not an inherent part of the classical dopamine story. It turns out that um, if you just train our recurrent um, neural network, our meta RL system, on this, uh, on this task structure, and then look at the reward prediction errors it emits, it does exactly the same thing. Um, so it does this kind of, uh, I think Bromberg, Martin, and colleagues called this um, uh, uh, the inferred value effect, and, and our model shows exactly the same thing. Why? Well, it's easy to figure that out when you look at the architecture. The hidden state of the network is keeping track of the latent state of the task based on recent outcomes. That hidden state is being used to compute the state value. The state value is, of course, being used to compute the reward prediction error, and so, of course, the reward prediction errors reflect um, uh, these latent state inferences. Okay, so just to wrap up. Um, I showed before uh, examples of, of how we can understand prefrontal um, circuits uh, implementing reinforcement learning algorithms uh, that are shaped over time by do dopaminergic uh, function. What I've just showed you suggests also that things can go the other way with prefrontal representations affecting uh, the way that dopamine uh, operates. And for those of you who know the literature, you'll recognize there's already a good deal of evidence for that. There are other simulations I don't have time to tell you about. One that shows how model-based RL can come out of model-free RL. Uh, another that addresses um, findings from the, the optogenetic literature. Um, but just to sum up, let's come back to the main theme, which was this learning to learn effect or kind of a demand for sample efficiency. Um, and I hope I've, I've communicated um, at least a theory for how we can get this from what are actually now fairly standard deep RL systems um, by just putting them in the right kind of environments um, and get from that uh, some new ideas about how dopamine and prefrontal cortex may interact. So just a couple of closing slides. Um, uh, there's much more to do um, in bo on both the AI front and the neuroscience front, mainly to see how we can scale these, these uh, kinds of uh, principles up. Uh, my interest is in seeing how that they can apply in se semantically richer and richer contexts, hopefully aiming for things like, like frostbite, like video game play. Um, and we're looking at ways of doing that, including ways of biasing architecture, rather than using these vanilla recurrent neural networks, using what we know about how to kind of nudge deep learning systems in the right direction uh, to learn interesting things. There are other forms of meta-learning that might uh, dovetail with this, like architecture search, for those of you familiar with that. Uh, and I mentioned uh, in response to a question earlier um, that bringing in episodic memory as a way of bridging longer temporal gaps is, is another thing that we've been working on. Um, and I just want to mention, uh, you know, I was excited to see the lineup of speakers because um, there, are, there are a number of talks uh, coming our way um, later on, in fact, one, one of them that immediately follows mine, that are going to raise, um, look at uh, topics that are, are germane to the, the, the computational um, schemas I've been laying out here, and I'm looking forward to thinking through the implications myself and talking with everyone about it. Finally, I just want to mention that you know, I think this project provides a nice illustration of how work in AI and work in neuroscience can synergize, um, forming what we, at DeepMind we like to call a virtuous circle, uh, each field helping the other. Uh, and then finally, I just want to acknowledge my collaborators, in, in particular, uh, Jane Wong and Zeb Kurth Nelson, who did a lot of the modeling that I've described. So thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I wasn't sure. So I get the arrow from the brain to the little droid. I cannot understand, but how do you get the arrow back? I mean, what, what have you learned about the brain by doing this? That's, that's my question. Um, well, I, can, I mean, that story can only be told from a first person perspective. Um, but I certainly, when I started out on this bit of work, was not thinking about reinforcement learning um, in the brain in these terms. So um, uh, Anne, in, in work I think she may, um, may tell us about, um, had already been doing work on the role of working memory in reinforcement learning. Um, and that seemed right to me. Uh, but it hadn't occurred to me to think about working memory circuits being tuned by dopaminergic learning. Um, and certainly, uh, it hadn't occurred to me that the result might be a learning algorithm that's quite different from 
uh, from the one that's, in, that's, uh, um, that's involved in, in dopaminergic learning. So at least for me personally, starting out with some computational questions and then realizing halfway through that these could map onto brain circuits was a useful, useful exercise. Uh, for those of you who are watching the live streaming, there is a hashtag if you want to send a question. Uh, Fritz. Um, so just to challenge a little bit, so, so you said basically, well, deep learning is good enough to, to <coughs> capture this learning to learn. And I would argue what you showed us here is really kind of a very simple generalization, where you basically just use the same rules and you change out some parameters. But how do you want to extend this to really challenging situations yeah. where you really change the rules from, from games? Uh, okay, so, so one thing that I found myself saying um, once we were deep into this work uh, to my colleagues was um, meta-learning or, or learning to learn is really only as interesting as the abstractions that are being uh, acquired. Um, so in, uh, in a bandit problem, the abstraction is well, there are two parameters, and I, I, you know, can at least implicitly understand what the distributions are that they're, you know, from which they're drawn. Um, in the correlated bandit problem I mentioned, the abstraction is has to do with the anti-correlation itself. Uh, in the Harlow task, there's there's a more interesting form of abstraction, which is there's one good thing and one bad thing, and I need to know that I can take two completely new objects and fit them into those those roles. So already we're into the realm of of that changed the parameters, basically. You know, it's, it's not, I mean, yeah, so you, you exchange the shapes, but it's the same. No, it's not a question of exchange. It's a question of, um, of binding, like, like of, ra of rapid binding, right? You've got objects you've never seen before. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not sure I see uh, a, a, a line, a, you know, a, a, a roadblock where we're, ne we're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, well, we're gonna hit a wall and we're not gonna be able to move to richer forms of abstraction. In other words, I think, the, the challenge is to find task domains where, what's ver where you have tasks that vary superficially, but then involve um, interesting forms of shared structure. Uh, and that's a, that's a very hard thing to build, uh, and I think that actually is gonna be one of the challenges in this, in this research. But so one thing that we're doing now at DeepMind, just to give you a sense of where this is headed, is building, build, this, let me finish the sentence, um, coming up with ways of procedurally generating video games so that you, you can play a thousand games in which there's an avatar and there are particular kinds of events that it can occur. And then you can sample a new video game where nothing's the same on the surface, but there are some concepts you may have to uh, apply, like, uh, oh, I know there are enemies. I know that I can change one thing into another by bringing a tool uh, in contact with it and that sort of thing. But, sorry, you were gonna go on. Let's take it Quick question, uh, um, Before you came, and if you others, we had a nice order in theory neuroscience thinking that uh, learning has to do with synaptic plasticity, and computation has to do with dynamics then. Mm. Now, if you go against this traditional thinking, um, since you're also a neuroscientist, I wonder uh, what is your motivation uh, for doing this, or to, to what extent we should not think in this direction? Um. I, I, early on, I, I, I talked to a guy named uh, Alex Puget about uh, what we were doing here, and he asked me this question, is this about learning or is it about inference? And I, um, I ended up just deciding I, I was unable to answer that question because I'm not sure what the difference is. Uh, so because I have that attitude now, I'm not sure how to sort those two things across synaptic change and activity. Um, uh, but having said that, I certainly think we know the difference between learning and inference when we see it. Right? And this comes back also, I think, to the question that was just raised about, like, how can you scale this up to like, really interesting uh, forms of transfer? So um, that's the best I can do, because I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I even know how to frame an answer um, that would be satisfying to me. One, one thing I'll add, though, and this, this also circles back a little bit to the question that was just raised, is I think that these mechanisms can extend to quite rich forms of inference that really um, would deserve uh, the label conceptual, you know, conceptual inference. Um, however, I don't expect uh, backpropagation through time in totally unstructured networks to find the right weights to do those, those things. So I think what we're gonna need is more interesting architectures uh, that effectively impose architectural biases uh, on the you know on the solutions that the network finds and therefore on the forms of inference uh, 
uh, that you'll see. So um, I think uh, I think um, my, my colleague Greg, Greg Wayne might talk about architectures that have um, properties that are along those lines. <coughs> we'll be able to talk more. Great. Thank you. Thank you.